Yes, sir, you are on. Good evening. On behalf of the Library Subcommittee of the Bengal Club, welcome to this evening's special discussion. On behalf of the Calcutta Architectural Legacies and INTAC, I also welcome you to this program, a program that um, promises to be an outstanding discussion, admiring the architectural achievements in our neighborhood. As we complete three quarters of a century as an independent nation, it is perhaps time for us to remind ourselves of Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which states that everyone has a right to participate in the cultural life of the community. And Article 5 of the 2001 UNESCO Declaration on Cultural Diversity, which recognized that cultural rights are inseparable from human rights. Heritage is very much our right. Architecture represents our might. It gives me even greater pleasure this evening to be able to welcome and introduce to you the spirit behind the Calcutta architectural legacies and a man who has conceptualized this entire program. A close friend who is a man of many parts. From professor of contemporary literature to professor of creative writing, a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature who has authored seven novels, an acclaimed poet, a musician who has performed on BBC and in the Queen Elizabeth Hall in London, it gives me great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce and welcome to this program, Amit Choudhury. On behalf of the Bengal Club, welcome Amit and thank you for conceptualizing the program. All yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chatterjee, for that, uh, you know, for setting the scene and laying the kind of groundwork in a sense for the rest of the evening. Um, and for the very generous uh, introduction. Um, <clears throat> now, I have some introduction. Uh, I, need to I need to thank a few people. Um, so I, of course, I want to thank the panelists. Um, I mean, these are panelists I wanted and I was lucky to have them say yes to taking part. So this is a wonderful, um, you know, uh, opportunity for me to, to be in conversation with them uh, about something that kind of uh, has preoccupied me and which, you know, uh, for, for years now and, uh, and something that I would like to hear their views on very, very much. Um, so the, as you know, the, the panelists in uh, alphabetical order, Channa Daswate, Esther Duflo, Sunil Khilnani, and Veera Nathan Ranganathan. Um, and um, I, I, will, I will introduce them when I uh, speak to them. I will introduce them again in more detail. Um, but as of now, I just wanted to say that I'm sort of um, in a state of anticipation about this conversation, notwithstanding the vagaries of Zoom. Let's put it that way, and my dodgy internet connection. Um, so, various other thank uh, you know people need to be thanked. Uh, and uh, because th this, this kind of thing doesn't just happen like that. So I wanted to thank Pratik Raja of Experimenter for designing the poster, Rajesh Sen for doing various things, including the Facebook Live page, Shorajesh Mukherjee, kind of uh, invisible legwork behind the scenes vis-a-vis -vis Bengal Club, uh, the, the distinguished uh, Rabindra Vasavada, uh, who, who said, you must, you know, you must start the conversation again. You started the conversation, started again, 
restart it. Um, and also put me in touch with, uh, uh, it was through him that I got in touch with Mr. Ranganathan. Um, Pradeep Kakkar and Komalika Bosch are part of the Cal group, others from that group as well. But these two I mentioned because I'll be using a couple of photographs. I'm gonna show you a few photographs in a few minutes, which they kindly shared among the group. Priyadarshika Das, who once created the Cal Facebook page. And uh, in spite of, uh, you know, just become a mother of a child, helped uh, us with the Facebook Live problem. We know next to nothing about how to do Facebook Live events. And she's young and uh, you know, she helped us. Um, now, a few more things to say. Reasons for the event. Why, why are we having this event now? Calcutta Architecture Legacies is something that I, uh, started along with other people, uh, citizens working uh, on behalf of this particular issue pro bono in 2015. And um, the, the aim was to raise consciousness about various things, including the importance, not just of individual heritage buildings, and, and, and monuments, but neighborhoods, the importance of neighborhoods in a city like Calcutta. Um, to look again at the, the buildings that we have in front of us and around us in South Calcutta and in the North. But the North was already known for having extraordinary mansions. The South, we have, you know, hadn't been looked at enough before, though it was right in front of our uh, noses. So it was to encourage people to look at the extraordinary buildings that had come up in the first half of the 20th century, unlike the last bit of the 19th century in the North. So North and South, not just to look at monuments and not just to look at the, the British institutional buildings, but the buildings that the Bengalis had made, whether these were 19th century landowners or professionals. Uh, doctors, lawyers, engineers in the South. How could we lose them, these buildings? That was what why Cal was instituted. And I think it, 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 it has helped create a consciousness in, 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 this, in this regard. Now, uh, just the consciousness by itself uh, only gets us, you know, to a certain point, but we need the Kolkata Municipal Corporation, the government, to become part of active part of this conversation. For these uh, neighborhoods to become historic neighborhoods, recognize heritage zones, places that will no longer be destroyed by de so-called development or developers. And over there, uh, uh, we had limited success breaking through to, to, to government and the municipal corporation. Uh, we did various things, uh, including a protest march, trying to hand over a letter to the mayor, a letter which was signed by various people, including Esther Duffler. Um, and when all of those things failed in 2019, uh, Cal, I, on behalf of Cal, with Intac, GM Kapoor, um, should also thank GM Kapoor and Intec uh, for being a co-partner to, tonight, but they have been a partner uh, for a long time. Uh, and that includes this very important public interest litigation in the high court. I cannot speak too much about it because it is sub judice, but the, the aim of the PIL was to stop listed buildings being downgraded or delisted. Because what was happening in Calcutta was listed buildings were being downgraded and downgrading usually meant downgrading to grade three and then the path was opened for demolition. So to stop that, um, to in fact encourage the KMC Heritage Conservation Committee to actively begin to add to a woefully inadequate list. 
and to introduce heritage precincts and then to share the workings of the KMC Heritage Conservation Committee and its composition with the public, to put that in the public domain, they, they, these things, these, these details were not in the public domain. So there was some success, uh, downgrading was stopped, the, the composition and the workings of the committee were put up on the KMC website. And at the end of 2019, GM Kapoor and I were invited to join the KMC for a conversation about how to take forward some of those issues that we'd brought up in the PIL, uh, a conversation started and then the pandemic happened. And um, after the pandemic happened, there has been a sense of disengagement about this conversation. Uh, and at the same time, a sense of disquiet that demolition has not stopped with the pandemic. The conversation has stopped but demolition hasn't. And over here, let me show you a few photographs to, to tell you, to, to give you two different narratives and share some documents with you very quickly before moving on to the discussion with the panelists. So if Mr. Mitro, uh, if you could show us photograph one of Lansdowne Road, of, of the Lansdowne Road building. Sure, sir. Thank you. No, that's, that's the Kalighat uh, building. If you can just show us the Lansdowne uh, Road building, picture one. Yes. So that's, that's the first picture I had wanted to show you. And this was shared with us by Pradeep Kakkar uh, last night in our Cal WhatsApp group. Uh, this building is going down in Lansdowne Road. So this is part of what I was saying earlier, the, the ongoing demolition, the, the, the lull in the conversation but the fact that the demolition is ongoing. Uh, the next picture, uh, the one after that, um, the Lansdowne Road building again, please. Uh, you want the Kalikat building? No, the, uh, there's another one of the Lansdowne Road. There were two, two more of the Lansdowne Road building. So that's the building in a further state of demolition. Now, when I saw those pictures, it stirred a memory in me and I thought uh, of another red colored building. And I was wondering whether that particular building where, uh, whose owner had, set, had got in touch with me, I think in 2019, um, where the owner had said to me, we want to sell our building, not to a promoter, but preferably to a person who will use the building. I was wondering whether that building had, had come down because that owner had also said to me that he had had, he was having trouble finding such a buyer. Can, can we, so I, I phoned that person and found out that that building, which is actually in Kalighat and not in Lansdowne Road, still stands. So can we go to the Kalighat uh, building? That's the interior of the Kalighat building, the veranda you saw, that's the building from the outside. And you can see it's a, it's quite a remarkable uh, residence, uh, 90 odd years old. Uh, and it is a, a, it exemplifies the fact that the, uh, uh, you know, if, if the earlier pictures of the Lansdowne Road building shows us that uh, there is a long way to go uh, and, and, and uh, um, demolition is ongoing, this uh, particular building exemplifies the fact that there has been a change of heart uh, and 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 uh, an acknowledgement among certain house owners of the possibility of selling their uh, of the importance of selling their buildings of their houses if they want to sell them not to a promoter but to somebody else who will use that building and 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 so th this building which you see in front of you 
is, um, is, is part of a turn, I think, uh, a very small turn uh, in, in the consciousness of uh, not only how people think of uh, residences in Calcutta, but owners of those residences who want to sell them. Um, we don't have time to uh, share the documents that I wanted to, but this year also saw uh, four uh, localities or neighborhoods in the South, Palm Place, uh, Baliganj Park, Baliganj Park Road, uh, Hindustan Park. Uh, so house owners in those localities send off letters to the KMC and to the commissioner of the KMC saying that we would like uh, our uh, neighborhoods to be declared heritage zones. And this was reported in the newspapers, but um, uh, this is a remarkable thing. The first time I think that such a thing happened here, and it shows again a growing consciousness, but there has been no response yet from the KMC. The very last thing that I wanted to add here are the election results. You can take this picture of Mr. Mitra, thank you so much. Um, uh, the last thing I wanted to add are the election results in May. Um, the kind of relief we felt uh, with the Trinamool uh, party's landslide win, um, because of its kind of promise to take in hand uh, and be a custodian of the constitutional and secular fabric of the history in this part of the world. But great things are expected of this government now because uh, part of that history, part of that secular modernity, uh, which they claim to want to protect and I, and I take them at their word because they have done some also some restoration work, uh, which, has, uh, which has been important. Uh, part of that history is the architecture, the buildings, the streets that we see around us. These are um, spaces and buildings that cannot be separated from that history of secular modernity. So, um, we cannot, we cannot protect secular modernity and decimate the, the city in which it happened at the same time. It, it, we must hold on to it. Um, so uh, as a government that has done uh, um, something in the past to revive the riverside uh, and, and the Robindra Sharbo lakes, uh, I think it, it can now begin to think more imaginatively of the larger sort of heritage it has uh, at its kind of excitingly, uh, it, it can do something with. Now, let me start now to speak to my panelists about their thoughts. And I want to begin with Esther Dufflo. Let me uh, just read out a few sentences uh, about Esther Dufflo. You already know who she is, but uh, just a few details. Esther Dufflo is the Abdul Latif Jamil Professor of Poverty Alle Alleviation and Development Economics in the Department of Economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a co-founder and co-director of the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab. Um, in her research, she seeks to understand the economic lives of the poor with the aim to help and design, to help design and evaluate social policies. Now, she has also got numerous academic honors and prizes, including the 2019, now I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get the, uh, the pronunciation wrong. Let's just call it the Nobel Prize uh, in economics to, to, to sort of, save me the trouble of pronouncing the, the words in the longer version, with co-laureates, Obhijit Banerjee, her husband, and Michael Kremer. Obhijit Banerjee has also been, um, he's aware of, of this initiative to do with heritage conservation here in Calcutta. 
and has supported it. Uh, Esther Duflo uh, um, interests me in connection with our conversation today because I remember seeing at this time when in 2015 we were launching this whole initiative and Cal, et cetera, had written something for The Guardian as an, an inaugural piece. And around the same time, there was a, there was a report in the Times of India uh, in which Esther Duflo, without knowing anything about this particular initiative said, uh, it's a shame what's going on in Calcutta. You know, the, 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 these wonderful buildings are coming down, being replaced by things, uh, you know, uh, 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 steel, uh, uh, faceless kind of, uh, constructions brought up by developers. Uh, here is a city uh, which which could be like Prague, uh, and 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 could in that sense do much more with what it has than what it uh, what it what it is doing right now. In fact, uh, even the chaos and the noise of Calcutta are um, would be astonishing uh, as part of its identity and what it is. It's, it's uh, well, I presume what she meant, uh, what you meant, Esther, was that uh, cities in the so called developed world, most of them are so, have been through so many filters that, that nothing very much is left. While here you have a metropolis in the old sense. But I want you uh, to, to tell us a little more about that and uh, speak to us both as a visitor to Calcutta, somebody who's had an ongoing relationship with it. and an ec economist and a, a, and a European, all of these things. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Amit. Amit, thank you so very much for, for inviting me. I feel very uh, uh, intimidated because I'm like completely out of my place and I've, uh, I've made a career trying to not say things about things I know nothing about and then suddenly I'm being thrust into this position. Uh, but uh, I am very glad to, to take part as long as it's common knowledge that I'm speaking from this point of view of uh, blissful uh, ignorance. Uh, so. Uh, Calcutta was a, uh, has played a, a sort of a, 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 a very important, strangely important part, maybe for a French girl, at several points in my life. Um, first, when I was a, a young child, because my discovery of, of poverty, so to speak, came from uh, um, a biography of Mother Teresa, which was uh, at the same time uh, a very caricatural representation of what Calcutta was. But this is, you know, this is what I had to go. And so I imagined the city uh, as a complete... Uh, um, hovel on a large scale. I also had read somewhere that uh, in Calcutta, people had only one square meter each to uh, to sleep. And at, at that time, I imagined the square meter must be one meter by one meter. And I was wondering how they slept and whether they had to curl up to, to sleep uh, until someone uh, kindly pointed out that you could have one square meter by two meters by 50 centimeters and therefore they could be lined up like sardines as opposed to uh, curl up in little circles. So this was my view of, of Calcutta. Uh, and, and then I reached, I, Calcutta is where I first landed uh, in India and uh, uh, where I spent the first few weeks, uh, my first few weeks in India when I was uh, uh, 20 or 21 and uh, it was a revelation maybe in part as uh, 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 because of this contrast between what the, the image I had formed and what was there in reality but I, but I think not only uh, because it was a, a city where you um, you could feel uh, intellectual life happening at all levels of society and at in all locations. So in particular, you have people uh, uh, doing uh, ADA on sidewalks and uh, uh, spending some time uh, getting uh, grooming or eating some snacks. And that is happening in, uh, in neighborhoods that are conducive to that, uh, which is actually something which is very rare in, uh, in, in, in cities in India and in cities in the developing world, world more generally, either because it was never there or because it has been uh, 
uh, decimated by by uh, urbanization by uh, um, lawless urbanization so you only have you have no sidewalks and no uh, places to stop and that's not the case in in calcutta and i uh, so I had all, uh, subsequently I kept coming and coming back and I I uh, truly love this uh, this city f f for that in particular and interestingly I was I'm just reading uh, Amartya Sen uh, memoirs and he has a whole chapter on the urbanity of Calcutta and of course he landed in Calcutta many many years before me and he and unlike me he has some competence in the subject. But what he has to say about the city is, in a sense, very similar, which is when he talks about the city, he doesn't talk uh, about uh, the building one by one, so to speak, but about what the uh, organizations of the building and of the life with the building uh, uh, produces. And in that, he insists, which was also very fundamental in, in, in my first discovery of Calcutta, especially since uh, it was at the same time as, as riots in Bombay, is how uh, wonderfully uh, um, multi-religious, multicultural the, the city was and how peacefully uh, it was in that way. And that's still the case today. Uh, and uh, Martesen does write Calcutta was and still is a wonderfully multicultural city. With uh, and that is reflected in a cultural heritage that spans uh, styles, uh, that is uh, uh, British inspired in part and uh, um, locally invented in other parts, and that um, where you have uh, in more than in other place, uh, any other place, including Paris, where I'm from and that I love, has this. Uh, um, embedded of the cultural and the architectural. And when I say that, I don't mean only the building by one by one, but how uh, they, uh, um, they live together to form blocks and neighborhoods. Hence, the, the analogy with Prague that I had given in, um, in that interview, which uh, um, omits so, uh, because when I visited Prague, I was struck by the fact that they had managed to keep uh, um, um, zones and re kind of protect entire zones where people could live and work and play and all that and not just individual buildings. And I think this is all, uh, also maybe the same thing is uh, uh, in Gaul, in around Gaul Fort that uh, uh, will be discussed by uh, uh, Janet Eswate afterwards, uh, which is it's not just the fort, it's the entire area around it that creates something. And the, each and every building doesn't have to be a gem for the whole thing to make sense. Uh, it's the area that makes sense. And I think this, if this were done, I thought then, and I still think now, that if this were done in at least some places, then this would become uh, a huge attracting forces for people to Calcutta. I think people would love to come visit Calcutta and spend there. Tourists from outside India, from inside India. The intellectual uh, vibrancy of the city, which is still there, is uh, almost unknown outside of, of West Bengal, outside of Calcutta. Uh, I had never heard of Durga Puja before, uh, before starting to spend time here. And I think if you started, if we started by having uh, several of these neighborhoods and uh, maintain them and conserve them and make them vibrant places, then it would kind of form the nucleus of something that would live on itself. Now, when when we discuss that, and that's 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 probably uh, illustrated by the public interest litigation, the fact that it quickly becomes uh, a fight. There is immediately the worry that oh, but it's terribly complicated. This old building doesn't have clear, don't have clear owners, and who is gonna be uh, responsible? And that's why they can't be sold. That's why they have the sold. That's why they have to go. Uh, and I think that's true for some places uh, in North Calcutta, and maybe there are some places that are just very, very hard to uh, to work with. Then my suggestion would be to to not say, well, if we cannot do it everywhere, then let's not do it anywhere. Because as Amit pointed out, there are places where I think it would be much easier. 
And maybe the buildings are not from the 19th century, maybe they are not the purest uh, uh, British heritage or, or what have you, but maybe they are from the 20s and 30s, like the beautiful uh, Caligate building you, you mentioned. And that's great. <laughs> and so uh, in that sense, uh, the, the spirit of uh, the life in the city, which involves not just the building, but the building and the streets and the, the peace that descends around 5 p.m. when the, when the birds are, are, are flying low and, and people are, are kind of uh, transitioning <laughs> in, in between their work day and their life day can be recreated. It already exists. It doesn't even need to be recreated. It can just be protected. I've seen it when I first came, and I still see it in some places, and I also see it go away from year to year because I see a new glass building uh, in the middle of that. And somehow people, you know, people make do, people are resourceful, but eventually the, the, the built uh, environment does matter. So this is uh, kind of where I would uh, say from an economist, you know, a narrow-minded economist point of view, I do think there is a win-win proposition in there in the sense that I do think that Calcutta has so much going for it as a cultural uh, capital, especially in the current environment in India and the fact that it's a beacon of, uh, uh, in, you mentioned the secular, secular modernity, that uh, it, 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 could, uh, um, it, could form, it could form a basin of attraction that would be you know, helpful for the entire city. And I, I, I think other panelists will talk about whether that happened in Gaul, but from my visit as a tourist there, I can certainly attest to it. So thank you very much for having me here and uh, um, and for leading these efforts. And I've been very pleased to uh, look at it from the sideline. Thank you, Esther. I mean, it was great to listen to you. I mean, we uh, this uh, conversation is a mix of uh, you know, non-experts and experts, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in this particular field of heritage conservation. I'm, I, I'm certainly no expert. I mean, we, we've had uh, um, uh, uh, panel discussions with experts uh, before, but today uh, we're trying to do something uh, uh, a little different and show how um, uh, this city and the con and this particular conversation we're having is is being thought about by all kinds of people you know not just conservationists um i just wanted to ask you quickly before before i move on to channa uh, uh the, the comparison you made with prague i mean well, was it fresh in your mind had you just been to prague what made you make that particular con uh, comparison no, I had not just been to Prague. I had been to Prague several years prior. Uh, it was present in my mind because uh, I, I thought because uh, they had uh, they, they they had to work for it because during the Soviet era, Prague was not Prague, <laughs> and in fact, uh, so I had not been to Prague before, but I had been to any number of Soviet uh, you know cities and. And I don't know if Prague was had ever been as bad as, as some other part of Moscow, for example. But uh, when I visited there, I was just struck by the fact that they had combined the um, the the preservation or renovation of the individual buildings with the creation of entire areas that are you know multi-purpose where people live and uh, live their lives and at the same time there are shops and there are uh, uh, galleries and um, places to for, to listen to music etc and I, I so um the the when i visit and, and it, it's immensely popular with the young tourist uh, crowd uh, in in europe and so that's why I thought this would be a good example. I'm sure it's not the only one, but it's not because it came to my mind as a random analogy. It was uh, something which I thought was was a good model. I had not been to gold yet, as yet, <laughs> so I didn't have that. Uh, I didn't have that example. But it's not like Paris, which in a way was always kept yeah. and uh, didn't need any like effort to come back. Uh, yeah. 
this is a place where at some point uh, there was a mindful a set of mindful steps had to be taken. Uh, I'm sure uh, some of them legal, some of them money, some of them architectural, urban design, and some someone put their mind to doing to to do it. So you're looking at cities with histories, but which are have also been through a period of trans significant exactly. transition with with, with history. Uh, very much like Calcutta, with history of culture and architecture, which went through a, a, a phase where people stopped thinking about it and came back, came back to, came back to it. But 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 if if Calcutta has uh, uh, this intelligence that you speak about, you know, uh, I mean, if you still feel that there is some intellectual vibrancy even now in the city, uh, why is this particular conversation? Why has it taken such a long time? to take off or, you know, do you, I mean, do you, would you hazard a guess? I mean, in terms of heritage conservation, uh, it's, it's been slower off the mark than, than other cities. I think because the, the actual destruction was also slower off the mark than in other cities, uh, in particular uh, in the south uh, of Calcutta, uh, where it remained, uh, very livable and, uh, and and beautiful until fairly recently, partly because Calcutta was, you know, not a, not the most booming city in India, so there was not a like there was less of a rush for uh, random building, and then the the, the random building started by happening uh, in places where they were probably not in the immediate sight of the intelligence. Yeah. So I think it's I, this is I don't that's that's my that would be my guess that's why it, it took a little bit of time that it's you know you we, we live uh, as human being we are uh, we are uh, misled by projection bias we tend to think that that things will stay the way they are now and so we tend to be one step behind the next catastrophe uh, and by the time it happened, then it already has started happening. But I think the, the opposite is also true, which is we uh, we should not assume that what is happening now can cannot be reverted. And 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 I think in part the difficulty that you are encountering now is because uh, too many people, be it in government, probably in the municipal corporation, but even amongst you know our meet, think it's just too hard. And that's why I'm suggesting that one should start by uh, something that can be done and then do it and then move up from there. And um, again, not uh, with the, the benefit of ignorance, I suspect that it is possible to find a zone where it's uh, really close to, to, to being possible legally. Yeah. Because a lot of people would agree and then... And, you know, you would start from that wherever that is, even if it doesn't have the most beautiful historical building, it will have plenty of history in the sense that you defined it with uh, secular modernity and in the sense that I discovered it when I when I landed. And that's kind of good enough to start, I think, the the enthusiasm uh, both uh, in, inside the city and outside the city. And therefore, uh, um, um, s uh, you know, s start the snowball. And thank you, Esther. That's that's great. Um, I'm going to move to Channa Daswate, uh, an Sri Lankan architect based in Sri Jayawardena Pure Kote, um, with an interest in social and design history about which he has written extensively. Um, so he uh, was a former chairman of the Gaul Heritage Foundation, Gaul Fort, which we have been referring to, uh, talked about just now, and uh, is also co connected with Calcutta and with con conservation over here. Um, so Channa and I actually met at, a, at the Gaul Literary Festival and, uh, some time, and uh, you know, at the uh, uh, Gold Fort. So, uh, Channa, I can't see you, but um, I will at any moment when I, when you speak. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so, I want you to tell us a little bit about the history of um, 
the golf for the success of uh, you know conservation over there in terms of uh, turning it into a heritage precinct what happened what what in what state it was prior to uh, you know this 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 kind of movement uh, just if you can t t tell us a little bit about that but also one other thing i mean i just want to tell people that i've i've invited you also uh, besides the fact that uh, that that you know uh, you're connected with conservation in sri lanka sri lanka has done wonderful things is to remind ourselves that that uh, there have been successes in india and in south asia uh, not to mention, you know, it's uh, over here, the moment you, uh, I mean, at least earlier on when one used to speak about uh, heritage precincts and zones, I mean, uh, you know, there are varieties of Indian uh, exceptionalism. I mean, it, for instance, uh, presuming you're going to win at a cricket match the moment they, they go into the field, but there, but there are other kinds as well. And Bengali exceptionalism is uh, takes on uh, its own peculiar form, it, for instance, saying that things can't happen here. This is Calcutta, it can't happen here. So one of the reasons, uh, you know, that you're important to this conversation is, I mean, it is possible in, in, in South Asia, uh, that kind of success. I wanted to tell us whether you face that kind of uh, lethargy or resistance as well, and then what happened after that? Well, yes. Well, thank you very much, Amit, for asking me to join in this conversation. And I think uh, it's it's a very, very it's a very timely thing because I think there's a lot of uh, you know wherever there is development. Of course, the pandemic has in at least in Sri Lanka sort of slowed quite some of the development down. But there's been a lot of work going on in Colombo and so on, uh, where lots of heritage precincts sometimes uh, get uh, overrun, uh, and uh, I mean uh, terrible things happen. Um, but in the case of Gaul, Gaul, of course, had for it going two things. One is, of course, the size of the precinct of Gaul. Um, it's, it, it, it's quite a small precinct. It's kind of probably the size of the precinct that Esther must be kind of thinking of for Calcutta, a bit that can actually mean something, even if it meant that they're not the best buildings. It just has a life in it. And in many ways, uh, Gaul was already that, because it's bounded by, of course, these incredible sort of ramparts, these great fort walls. Uh, and the, the reason Gaul had become almost frozen in time was that Gaul, having been the most important port in Colombo in the late 19th century, uh, in Sri Lanka in the late 19th century, uh, the port moved Colombo. And with it, lots of the big business uh, you had the big sort of uh, colonial companies, which had their headquarters in the Gaul fort, simply moving to Colombo with the port. And in many ways, Gaul then sort of uh, went into a very slow decline. Uh, it's not that nothing happened there. We, we, we still see beautiful buildings from the 1930s. There's all of that that went on. I mean, life went on being lived, but it didn't have the same kind of pressures that, say, for instance, Calcutta had and probably continues to have. So what happened, of course, by the uh, early 1980s was that uh, Gaul was this sleepy old town. There's, in fact, a lovely book written about Gaul, this sleepy old town. Uh, and many of the buildings that had come up between the 6th century, some of them 16th, 17th century, uh, and the 1920s and 30s and 40s were still very much intact. And it is here that a group of architects, which included uh, Mr. Ashton Divorce and then the then uh, head of ICOMOS in Sri Lanka, uh, Professor Roland Silva, who was also an architect, uh, felt that perhaps Gaul might be observed in some sort of way. And it, of course, the fort and the old buildings, that any old building that is that was built before 1815, um, a particular date of the signing of the Cadian Convention when Sri Lanka, the final kingdom was handed over to the British, that's the date of our antiquities ordinance. Any building that's built before that is automatically protected. So much of the whole fort, including the ramparts and so on, were protected by the Antiquities Ordinance of 1940, which was then changed in 1998 and so on. But to actually preserve the, the whole fabric of the Gulf fort required a little bit more effort. And I think uh, it was due to a lot of these people who, who did uh, some incredible surveys of the buildings that were there, 
uh, the good, the bad and ugly, as Esther says, it's not all the buildings in Gaul are absolutely beautiful and gorgeous. They're just everyday buildings that people put up over a period of 200 years uh, and said, look, perhaps this needs to be preserved. And this was, of course, the time when many of many, when the whole UNESCO World Heritage System was coming into play uh, and people began to see the importance of that. And uh, Sri Lanka proposed that Gaul should become a World Heritage Site. In fact, very interestingly, it was one of the first colonial sites being recommended as a heritage precinct by the colonized people. So in, in a sort of way, there was an acceptance that this was a part of our heritage as much as anything else. Before that, or everything else that had been proposed before had been the great monuments of the past, you know, first century capital of Anuradhapura and so on. But this became the first of the colonial, uh, in the colonial uh, monuments to actually become uh, proposed for World Heritage. And in 1988, it was inscribed in the World Heritage List. Of course, this then, and this of course came from the government. That's the state party, the government had to make the pro proposition, make the rules for themselves. And of course, at that time, Professor Roland Silva, Ashley DeVos and all these people were very, very uh, involved in creating the rules that we were to play by in preserving uh, the, the, the city. And uh, it's protected under the Antiquities Ordinance. It's also protected under the U UDA regulations. Now, the Urban Development Authority was set up in 1987 in Sri Lanka to, to deal specifically with urban matters. And the Urban Development Authority has the authority to set up regulations, special regulations for cities. And Ball has a special set of regulations that, that kind of tells you the shape and size of roofs you can have. And, and so on. So all of this was then applied to the city of Gaul. And a huge encouragement was given for the life of the fort to continue. And any conservation and restoration happened while the people continued to live there. Uh, of course, by then a large number of the, the state organizations were also uh, occupying the fort. So in many ways, it was still the capital of the South, people came and went. Uh, and so in many ways, the, 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 the city continued to live. Uh, and, and there was this population that went on. So in many ways, while you see it as a success story and because it was held that way, when tourism eventually began to boom in Sri Lanka, Gaul became a hotspot for people visiting a colonial city. Now, that's where in many ways, I mean, the, 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 the flip side of protecting something and keeping it beautiful is also that it brings in the attention. It's the kind of Venice factor. You have this beautiful state, everybody wants to come there. And Gaul also had to face these issues. And uh, in that time when I was chairman of the Heritage Foundation, now the Heritage Foundation was also set up so that the rules that were set up by the UDA could be monitored by a special group of people that all the government officials who had to get involved in making decisions about the fort was brought together by the Heritage Foundation for, for a monthly meeting to resolve any of the issues that the, the, the residents had, the, um, the, any, any conservation issues. So there was archeology, span there was the UDA, there, was, uh, uh, there were three citizens representatives on it. So it's a, it was a group of about 20 people, all of whom were directly involved in the golf fort, who would meet once a month to discuss the issues that were important to the fort and to the life of the fort. Now, of course, by the time I became chairman, it was a time when tourism was booming. And of course, this has its own challenges. Every resident wants to make their home into a hotel. Every resident wants to make their home into a, into, a, into a restaurant. And of course, the life of the city begins to slightly get affected. In fact, it was getting seriously affected to the extent that the, the three monks in the one Buddhist temple. So the fort, of course, is a very, very multi cultural uh, location. There are mosques, there are churches, there are, there's a Buddhist temple. Uh, and it's very, very interesting because they borrowed each other's architectural styles. If you look at the Buddhist temple, it looks like the Gothic church that was built at the top of the road in the 19th century. And the mosque looks like a sort of Italianate church that was built somewhere else. So there's all of this going on in the fort. But one of the complaints the monk had was that, look, you know, Buddhist monks depend on arms being given to them for their food. They suddenly said, look, there aren't enough people living here to give me arms. So there was this whole business of how sometimes pressures in these beautiful heavy precincts can also begin to uh, affect the, the life of the place. And it was uh, 
not easy to convince people um, once that, you know, it was in, in a way, you know, th there was always this effort, not so much effort, these inadvertent processes that almost began to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. There was this beautiful precinct site. And then everyone would come and say, oh gosh, but I want two extra rooms, sir. What do we do? And then of course the roof goes up, the lines get messed up. And so there was all of this battle between uh, authorities, some citizens who wanted to protect it and others who of course get affected by the money that is possible to make and so on. So the fort has had its own share of uh, huge success in that it's managed to survive all these years uh, and any conservation has been controlled as much as possible. But there's, it has also always been a battle. It has been a battle uh, to, to kind of resolve the ideal middle part of the pressures of economics and uh, the pressures of, 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 of uh, commerce and of course, the life and lifestyle of the fort itself. Uh, so, so, so in many ways, um, it, the creation of a precinct site can also become its own sort of reason uh, for it to fall apart. So while Gaul is a great success story and anybody visiting Gaul um, at its height, certainly just before what we call the Easter bombings that happened in 2019, April, uh, I remember going there two days after it happened in Colombo and all the tourists had left and not even Sri Lankans were visiting the public spaces of the fort. Uh, and I have a couple of photographs where it's absolutely empty and not a single shop was open, not a... So of course, it has been very, very difficult since then. Um, and some of the conservation, a lot of the conservation work has stopped because in the end, it's also the commerce that brings in the conservation. Commerce helps you to to, to restore your buildings, uh, because these are not communities that have vast amounts of money and it's necessary for commerce to come in and the right balance to be struck to, to have the right kind of conservation and for life to go on. It would be terrible if the entire city, like in some cities you see in Europe as well, uh, simply turned, turned, became, became a, a tourist precinct. It becomes Disneyland um, and, 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 and that's really terrible. Uh, so it's to keep that balance that I think uh, you, you, you need, to, you need to, to fight. And I think uh, the community in the fort recently, I mean, I had conversations with them. I mean, although I am not uh, no more the chairman of the foundation, I do have an interest. I go and come to the place. I know a lot of the people there. Uh, and they've been in conversation with me about some of the things that they didn't like that was happening. And they had actually had a major sort of protest, uh, a sort of the, 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 the citizens had got together and said, look, no, we don't think we like the kinds of development that are being imposed on us. Uh, so in many ways, uh, citizens also need to take uh, a position and they do need to, um, to, to have ideas about, about their environment and their community. It can't all come from above, it can't all come from just the NGO groups, but it's also about encouraging citizen action. And I think uh, in, in, in Gaul, that is very much the case. There are a whole a younger generation of Gaul residents uh, who are very aware and very conscious of the value of their city. And I think that's, that's a very, very important aspect of, of, of heritage conservation. Uh, awareness of how important it is, awareness of the commerce and what it can bring to you, but also awareness of the limit to which you should allow commerce to take, take over. Sure, that's wonderful. I'm glad you raised that point because I know that there, are, uh, you know, other cities have faced this. Uh, Venice, Edinburgh. I can see James Simpson over there. I know that this is a concern of his in Edinburgh. Uh, what 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 you've just talked about, and yet if the buildings don't exist, then the you know the problem is you know, <laughs> the, the problem is precluded in a very sort of drastic uh, way. You know, um, so uh, if the buildings exist, the, you know, we, we go through that phase, we, uh, and then we can decide what to do exactly. you know, with exactly. those, those buildings. Um, uh, I have to move on, but I quickly wanted to ask you if, very, if you can just give us yeah. your thoughts very briefly, I mean, since you've worked in Calcutta as well. I mean, mm, because the way you portray this, uh, the, the dialogue that led to you know, conservation uh, is, 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 is amazing. I mean, um, 
it's as if egos were set aside. I'm sure this is not true, but you know, and, and civilized conversations, it was possible to have those, you know, to, to arrive at this. Now, I think it's important to have those civilized conversations. I think. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Now, is it possible here in Calcutta? I mean, of course, I mean, there are very I mean, my, my experience of a Calcutta conservation has been very, very brief. Um, I, I, I helped uh, uh, one of my friends to restore an old house, uh, which eventually became a restaurant. That was commerce helping uh, an old building to be restored. It was a beautiful old house that had been lived in for generations by a Bengali family. Uh, and then uh, they fell. Uh, and fortunately, it was a sale that uh, was going to lead to the conservation of this building. And, and, and that's, what, that's exactly what we did. We, we conserved it. Uh, it. It eventually became a restaurant. Unfortunately, it wasn't a success as a restaurant. Uh, one of the problems, of course, with that was it was the one building. And that's that issue. Again, Esther showed that, and you've spoken about it, Amit. You can't just have the freestanding one building. You need to have a whole area for the economics to take on. And that's the difference between Gaul and my ex conservation experience in, 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 in Calcutta. Yes. Uh, there was another project that we tried to do that, of course, went into got, got into a little bit of, uh, I mean, it slowed because of uh, some apathy from the part of the, 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 the KMC. Um, I, I, I don't want to be, I'm outside, that shouldn't be making critiques of this, but there is some apathy that some, that's not uncommon in most uh, municipalities of uh, South Asia. As you say, that whole business of, you know, it can never be done here. Uh, always comes in and it takes a lot of effort to push something through because uh, it, it's, just, it's it's I mean in Gaul I had the problem of trying to make it into a pedestrian precinct uh, and, and the police simply said no but I don't think it will work although 90% of the citizens signed the petition to say we want but the authorities simply said no because they're not used to it. Now the Calcutta experience is I think uh, a classic example of uh, why you need to preserve entire precincts right so that the whole fee is there and people will then start coming and, and using thank, them thank thank you for saying that thank you for pointing that out uh, it needs pointing out uh, endlessly i think until you know the change <laughs> begins to happen yes. but until then it does need pointing out you know uh, to be part of the process. Process. Yeah. it should yeah. be part of it um, <laughs> Can can I can yes. I just interject just with one one thing? Uh, I completely I found this experience fascinating. I, I wanted to ask, add one thing just to the last point, which is uh, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, people are so imaginative that some sometimes it doesn't even take that much to create the space where that life can uh, develop. Um, so, for example, in Paris, um, there used to be a highway along the verge of the Seine which is like crazy, <laughs> it just was like murder <laughs> to put a highway along the, along the bank of the Seine. And uh, uh, there was a huge fight to find out if it could be made pedestrian instead. Uh, and uh, finally the fight was resolved halfway, glass half full, glass half empty to say you can make it pedestrian, but you cannot build anything on it. You cannot like improve it. It stays a highway, but now cars can't go on it, so pedestrians can go on it. That's it. That, so that's because of the a fight between the city of Paris, who wanted to make it pedestrian and preserve it or re-improve it, and the region that wanted to keep the highway. So they just blocked the car. And then it has become this incredible, like incredibly lively place which has been completely invested by people and they are uh, temporary structures and uh, um, it's uh, uh, so that life and in fact that the combination of that commerce and that tourism like came to it so in a sense if, as long as some amount of a space uh, can be preserved um, searching for perfection can make it can prevent it to happen but opening the space can uh, you know i'm not saying it can work in every t every time but it, especially in this type of environment where people are happy to be outside and hang out uh, yes. would create the magic that might start the 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 thing i agree i mean it, even in terms of i mean actually achieving something like this uh, in uh, you know 
the heritage precincts and neighborhoods we're talking about, what you refer to as the perfect conditions. I mean, those always keep, uh, those are always an argument against action, against making something happen because people keep saying, this is not the right time. Let's, let's wait for the right moment. You know, they're all, all of these problems uh, and, and, and this is not the right moment. I don't think these, 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 these conservation movements had their success at the right moment. They created their own right moment. The right moment was not presented to them. Um, I want to now introduce quickly Sunil Khilnani uh, and move on uh, to Sunil to ask him a couple of questions. Sunil Khilnani is professor of politics and history and Dean Ashoka X at Ashoka University. Uh, prior to that, Kilnani was Avanta Professor and Founding Director of the India Institute, King's College, London. And there, there are many other uh, distinguished academic uh, positions, too numerous to, 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 to read out now, but I just want to mention some of his publications, uh, Arguing Revolution, the Intellectual Left in Post-War War France, and the very famous, uh, the idea of India, whose 20th anniversary edition was published in 2017, several other books, uh, and, and, and more recently, uh, Incarnations, A History of India and 50 Lives, which, which accompanies his 50 part uh, BBC podcast and radio series. So Sunil, um, again, I mean, I asked Sunil because I was very struck by some of the things he said at, uh, I think it was last year, when the Central Pro uh, Vista project was underway um, it, here in, in India, in Delhi, and he uh, was speaking to an interviewer from the Times of India. And um, I was, I was uh, um, struck by uh, uh, everything he said, and in particular, what he said about modernist buildings or modern buildings. And if I understood him correctly, how our kind of imaginative and intellectual engagement, and here probably I'm also kind of conflating my own thoughts with his uh, and interpreting him in a particular way, how uh, imaginative and historic engagement doesn't encompass this particular modernity, which we always often confuse for being a derived modernity. A modernity must be something that must have come from the West. So it's not really ours. And that immediately leads to a sense of disavowal of its, of its spaces and buildings, spaces and buildings which we have inherited and lived in and still live in. So uh, the history then becomes everything that happened before and is pure and you know, uh, happened before the British, now for the BJP, it happened before the, before the Mughals or the Delhi Sultanate, probably. Uh, and, um, and, and, the, and this, this leads to a, a, a kind of, even at, if not a, 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 at best an indifference, at worst, worst a hostility, which might be taken advantage of to do th things that are happening now. That's only one of the reasons why Central Vista is being overhauled but Sunil points out this as being one, this disengagement, if I understood him correctly, as being one of the con contexts. So Sunil, I just wanted to ask you to sort of um, give us your, a, a more general sense of what you feel about the place of modern architecture, whether these are monuments or neighborhoods or houses or, or the everyday as lived in these spaces in India in the last 200 years, what, what role does do these play, spaces uh, play in our consciousness? Um, and um, if they are not sufficiently part of our understanding of our history, why is that so? Uh, what is your view of what's going on, not only in Central Vista, but what's going on at this, uh, is going to happen at, maybe at the Sabarmati Ashram, what, maybe is a foot in Banaras in the corridor leading to the Vishwanath temple. If, if you have any thoughts on the more general context over here. Thanks so much, Amit. And <clears throat> thank you for this invitation. Um, as, as I have to um, 
uh, align myself with Esther in saying, you know, I'm really not an expert at all on this. Um, and I speak um, as a citizen uh, rather than as a professional expert. And I have to say, it's really heartening to see the numbers of people that you've been able to convene um, for this meeting and this initiative, this is this discussion. And, and I clearly it's been part of an ongoing discussion. And I'm 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 very glad to 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 be able to just step into it at this this point. I mean, I I, I think um it, it's it's really a, a question ultimately of a kind of attitude towards the past um, and whether one thinks of those bits of the past that um, one no longer approves of or one is unhappy with or resentful about, whether one thinks of that as something to erase or as something to complicate um, and to add another layer to as you move forward. Um, and, and I think um, all of the three uh, cases that you mentioned, which are of course um, you know, very much in the spotlight uh, with our current government in Delhi um, as areas to redevelop. That's to say that Rajput, the Central Vista, um, the Sabarmati Ashram uh, and, and the Banaras, uh, uh, the Ghat uh, area leading up to the uh, uh, Vishwanath Temple. Um, they're all um, obviously very different sites, very different moments in Indian history, different in scale, um, but they're all, um, I, I think each, each of them, it, it, they do share something. They, they embody um, respectively uh, the, the part, if you like, power and belief, kind of shaping forces of, of, of human society, really. Um, and and they're, they're charged with meanings. They have multiple significances. Um, they're, 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 they're the product of, they embody contestations, struggles, affirmations, aspirations. And, and as such, they're, they're, not, they're not buildings or sites like any other. And I think, um, you know, if you take the, the sort of imperial processional of Delhi, which after 1947 gets remade as a site to try to, um, enact and display the Indian Republic and, and its democratic ambitions. Uh, if you take you know, the one room hut or cottage where, where, where Gandhi lived, where he tried to sort of imagine a different future for his compatriots, or if you take the kind of gully, the gullies and, 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 and alleyways of Benares, the sort of intense adjacencies of worship that you find there, um, they're all sites that transcend their instrumental purposes. The, the, they have a purpose, but there's sites that transcend those instrumental purposes. And, 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 and they have, I think, through the very persistence of time, acquired as layers of meaning, a kind of patina, um, as, as does a, a well-used um, pot or, or object. Um, they, they have different fingerprints on them. They have different uh, sweat marks, different, um, this, this is all part of, and if you like, this is also part of what gives them their, their enchanted quality. They have a kind of aura, uh, which is distinctive to them. And I think what's, what, what I find so, so, so tragic and, and dismaying about the current um, political engagement with them um, is, is, is um, a kind of reductiveness of vision, um, which sees them purely in terms of functional physical structures. Um, and and, and in, in terms of a kind of, you know, and, and functional physical structures that can somehow be rearranged to serve different purposes, to kind of come under different ideological agendas. Um, and, and, and I think this, and, and you know, they, they've been entrusted each of these very three different sites to the same architect, the same practice um, who, <laughs> seems to me to kind of embody, you know, without being too, too facetious, a kind of the, a vision of a kind of brand consultant with a kind of CPWD approach, um, of course, higher production values, CPWD, but, but that, that sort of approach to, 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 to buildings. Uh, and I think, um, you know, the, 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 it, it's important to see buildings such as these, but even more generally, um, that they're, they're not, um, purely instrumental, they have meanings. Um, and they have meanings that 
uh, kind of generated through their systematic arrangement with one another. Um, and I think, you know, the emphasis that e e each of you uh, on, on the panel have made that, that to think in terms of neighborhoods or precincts or areas or sectors, I think that's very, very important. That these are not just individual buildings. Um, and, and, and that it's an urban landscape or indeed an urban ecology. And as that term suggests, these evolve over time. They're not static. Um, they, they, they're added to, they they're accretions of human intention over time. Uh, but they're also very fragile as we know ecologies are. Um, um, so they're both, they're, uh, when they're there, they have a kind of um, fixity and stability that seems permanent, but they're also very fragile. And, and I think, you know, the, 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 to, to, to try and, um, uh, they're a sort of lived in archive of the society, if you like. And, and I think what, what we're seeing in the, in the three, three, three projects that you mentioned and uh, that we've been talking about is, is an attempt to kind of rip that archive up and, and, and to um, start something new, to kind of e e erase uh, some aspect and to rearrange it in a different way. And I think that, that's, that's really, um, um, you know, what I find very, very disturbing uh, about that. I, I think, you know, it was interesting that in the introduction also, there was this mention of cultural rights or rights to culture. And I think one of the interesting developments that we're seeing now, and it emerges out of um, uh, the destruction of cultural um, sites and cultural zone uh, uh, buildings in um, zones of conflict, um, but is this notion of the duty to protect um, the duty to protect, protect cultural rights. The duty to protect, of course, has emerged in terms of human uh, protections for, for, for refugees and, 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 and so on. But there's also a sense that we do now have a duty to protect cultural um, uh, goods. Um, and and I, I think you know, that's something that maybe can be mobilized in, in some of the discussions in, in India. And we, we, Calcutta, I think, which you're focused on, on is, is, is an extremely important case, but there are many others uh, in India too. Um, uh, you've written about Pune, um, uh, you know, the, there's, there's Panjim, there's uh, places like Madurai, uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the incredible buildings of Sidpur in Gujarat, the, 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 the Bora uh, Habeli's there, there's, uh, you know, Mushita, but there, there's so many sites which have to be taken as a whole. They're not just about individual buildings. They're, 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 the, um, they're, they're the creations of an entire community and society over time. Um, and, and I think that, that's, that value has to be recognized. Of course, trying to make that happen is much more difficult because the collective action problems are much harder. With, with, with a single building, uh, you know, if the government decides to do something, it can kind of push its weight in. But with these larger um, neighborhoods, the collective action problems are, are more difficult. And, and um, the part of that difficulty also is that there isn't a single currency of valuation for these sites. We, we've, we've spoken about the economic, there's the aesthetic valuation, there's the cultural valuation, but, but there isn't a sort of single common accepted currency. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that hopefully conversations like these will do is to try and create um, a, a language of valuing and valuation, which can be persuasive to larger uh, groups of people um, and, and help to kind of, you know, address some of the collective action problems that, 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 that we're, we're facing. So, so those are kind of my more, more general thoughts um, uh, 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 about this, but um, but you know, by goodness, we, 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 it was pointed out that you know, how quickly um, this, uh, this urban fabric can change and how fragile it is. And I think that's something we really have to, um, uh, it, it, it goes overnight as, as, as the photographs that you showed of the Lansdowne building uh, earlier. And, and once it's gone, it's gone. Uh, it's like the Amazon forest. Thank you, that is wonderful. Um... I would have asked, we're running out of time. Uh, we're going to overrun as a result, but I was going to ask you more. Uh, uh, maybe there will be other opportunities. I mean, just, just to respond quickly, uh, oh, the, 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 the instrumental kind of uh, uh, 
take or viewpoint that you're talking about, of course, uh, uh, didn't just originate with the BJP. It's been there for, for a while. The BJP is acting upon it now. It's been there for a long time. Uh, I can't remember who it was who said that uh, Bombay, Mumbai has to be turned into Shanghai. Uh, but, but that was a long time ago. Um, and and um, why, why we don't hear more of this conversation in this particular terms to do with the patina that you're talking about? Something uh, that uh, Tanizaki uh, used uh, the word in, in translation in his book on Japanese architecture, uh, and and wh why that conversation doesn't happen a bit more uh, is 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 something we could talk about if you if you had the time. It's a fascinating sort of topic, and uh, 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 the the theme of disavowal has come up in Channa's uh, you know what he said in terms of the Gulf Fort, you know not being seen to be their history, but then, then the, the people over there taking a decision to embrace it as their history. And, and uh, with the Central Vista, it's a kind of destruction of something as being not ours, you know. Um, with, with Calcutta, there, there, there might be two sources or, or two or three sources of hostility. I mean, the, 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 the British institutional buildings, they're colonial buildings. The buildings in the south uh, are, are the buildings that the Bhadralok or the bourgeoisie made. Now, they also may not be authentic. The buildings in the north were the buildings of the so-called, uh, you have to always preface it with that, with those words, Bengal Renaissance. Maybe the Bengal Renaissance never happened. So we, we are facing uh, a rhetoric that's to do with our modernity to say that it is, in a, it, it is contestable and, and therefore, the buildings become endangered uh, because the, 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 the history is never properly engaged with as being not authentic enough. Yeah, no, absolutely. But, but you know, part of also, I think what we need to do is to understand that modernity is also a history of exclusions. Uh, it's a history of, of suppressions as well. And, and, but, but the point there is not to kind of uh, try to, to, to erase the entire modern inheritance in order to assert those who may have been excluded or, or suppressed. It's to complicate the picture. Uh, and I think, and that's really a truly historical approach to it, um, rather than some notion, some, some kind of idea that te technologically or technocratically, you can start all again. You can go back to tabula rasa and re-engineer um, the world. You can't. And I think you know what, what, what's been what's been so interesting in in, in in societies that have have complicated and and dark and awful histories behind them, as our own does, as, as we do, um, is is that they have tried now. You know, in some cases, they've tried now to recognize that darkness. So whether it's Berlin trying to make sense of its own historical past without simply erasing that but complicating it, or whether it's the US, the America, um, with something like the mall, which is celebratory, but now also has got buildings which admonish Americans about their past, whether it's the Museum of African American History or the Museum of, of, of you know, the Native American. I mean, the, the, these are um, uh, uh, complications rather than um, erasures. And, and, and I think that's something that, that you know, as a kind of mature democracy, we have to kind of face up to um, that, that, that um, over, overcoming the past doesn't mean being amnesic about it. It means confronting it and, 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 and finding place for all those other things that didn't have a place before within it. And architecturally, I think architecture and the urban ecology and landscape is a crucial medium and, and forum for within which that can happen and should happen, um, because that, after all, is the lived reality um, that, that, that we all experience. Great. Thank you, Sunil. And now I'm going to move on to Mr. B. Ranganathan, who um, served in the government of Maharashtra and in the government of India for 37 years. He was municipal commissioner of Mumbai and chief secretary government of Maharashtra. And then he, he was also chairman of the Heritage Committee of Mahabaleshwar Panchgani for three years, chairman of the Mumbai Heritage Conservation Committee and convener of INTAC. 
so um, he has he has worked uh, as an ad, uh, um, an active advocate of 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 uh, conservation and restoration in Maharashtra and Bombay from within uh, you know these locations uh, the civil service uh, corporation government so um, I wanted him to be part of this conversation because it seems to me now that it is it is extremely important to have somebody in the civil service the government or the municipal corporation who supports these initiatives uh, uh, without uh, without support coming from that direction without a, a sense of investment in these things coming from that location it is extremely difficult to move ahead so it seems to me from what i've seen of other cities especially no, including cities in India, is that each one of these cities in which there has been a success in this regard, somebody or more than one person in uh, the municipal corporation or the government has played an active role. That is still to happen in Calcutta and West Bengal, at least to my knowledge, I may be wrong. So can you, can you tell us something a, a, a bit about uh, Mr. Ranganathan, about conservation in, in Bombay, uh, heritage precincts, Bombay has heritage precincts, um, and um, the role of, of people like yourself and, and the corporation in, in making this happen, if you could uh, share a little bit of what your views are of this history. Hi, good evening. Now, uh, you know, the first point I want to make is heritage conservation is often equated with the conservation of heritage buildings. It is much more. See, natural heritage, water bodies, hills, beaches, open grounds, forests, trees, these also constitute a part of heritage. Now, for instance, the oval ground in South Mumbai that has been declared as heritage ground so that it is preserved in a condition in which it was developed and remained, it does not get parceled out. Similarly, recently, the Preservation of Trees Act in Maharashtra was amended to say that certain trees can be declared as heritage trees and uh, special permission of the government will be required if anybody wants to cut those trees. And uh, this is, I believe, following the example of Singapore, which has a concept of heritage trees. So I think these also should be treated as part of the heritage, not merely buildings. Then uh, second point, of course, you had mentioned about heritage prisons. Now, people fail to understand very often if an in individual building cannot be classified as heritage, how can a group of buildings in an area be considered as heritage? This is because, you know, when you develop a series of buildings in an area, they, uh, during the British rule, what they used to do was when they developed a particular area, after preparing a layout with broad roads and more or less plots of the same sizes, then they would, the government architect would prepare a model plan. Now, in that model plan, there could be individual variations, but construction has to conform to the model plan in all the plots in the building. This is a, for instance, marine drive developed, where you will find not only are all buildings of the same height, but all the floors of the buildings are of the same height. So it presents a very um, aesthetic appearance, the form and also the uh, characters, the natural features, and even street furniture. They give a, uh, I would say very aesthetic and pleasant look. So I think this heritage presence also do require to be preserved uh, apart from individual buildings. And uh, third point is when you talk about a heritage building, particularly the heritage buildings in class one, the highest level, it is not merely the building has to be conserved. The surroundings have also to be conserved. Because normally when you have a narrow street and tall, beautiful buildings, it's difficult to appreciate that. But 
if you have, for instance, like Gateway of India, if you want to really appreciate the Gateway of India, the entire surrounding area has to be preserved. Otherwise, you don't get the perspective, you are not able to get the uh, visual appeal of the area. So that is also, it is not so the heritage regulations say in A-class buildings, not merely the buildings, but within 100 meters around the building, you have to see that any activity or construction or any work requires to be controlled. This is one. Then uh, uh, it has to be been tuned with the overall landscape. The building has to be viewed as a part of that. Now, coming to the uh, regulatory aspect, uh, Maharashtra was the pioneer state in framing heritage regulations, which are framed on in April 1995. Now, basically, the legal framework is for the entire state, that's the Maharashtra Regional Town Planning Act, which empowers the state government to prepare development plans for a city or for a region and introduce various regulations for development. Now, usually the procedure is these draft regulations are notified. Objections or comments are invited from the public for 90 days, or 60 days, and then after considering the objections, wherever they have to give a hearing, they give a hearing, and then finally the rules are notified. Now, as part of the development control regulations, um, now the recently, for instance, in Mumbai, they were notified. They are now using the terminology DCPR, um, uh, Development Control Planning Regulations. Now, what they have done is, as a part of these regulations, there are um, um, heritage regulations have been framed. Now, these heritage regulations, uh, firstly, um, uh, empower the state government to declare certain buildings in various categories of heritage. Heritage category 1, 2, 2A, 2B, and 3. That is one. Second thing is, these regulations also provide that the state government shall appoint a heritage conservation committee for um, each city or each region for which these rules are notified. And this committee has to consider all proposals for any construction, alteration, modification, any of these buildings. So usually the procedure which is followed is, for instance, in the city of Mumbai, if any person wants to construct a building or alter or demolish or do anything, he has to apply to the building proposals department who will examine it and along with the uh, development control regulations, the zoning of the area, the construction permitted, nature, etc., etc. Now, while examining it, if it happens to be a heritage building, it is referred to the heritage committee for a no objection certificate. Then the committee examines it, and unless the activity performed conforms to the heritage character of the building, it is not, um, uh, NOC is not given by the committee. And uh, once the recommendation of the committee goes to the municipal commissioner, as a matter of practice, they are accepted. In fact, in the, in the three years and odd, when I was the chairman of the Mumbai committee, there is only one occasion for the metro um, construction that the uh, recommendations of the Heritage Committee were overruled. Otherwise, they have so, generally been accepted. Mr. Ranganathan, how is it that the Heritage Committee has this sort of ah, independence? is notified by the State Committee. See, this is one of the points I wanted to mention. That, you know, uh, basically, if you are constituting a committee um, at the level and by the municipal corporation, it is subjected to day-to-day -day pressures and political compulsions. It is difficult for a committee to function individually. So the Heritage Committee notification of heritage regulations, notification of buildings as heritage buildings are present. This, I think, should be at one level removed from the day-to-day -day political um, machinery. It is going to the state government. I think that is a uh, necessary requirement. Otherwise, it is difficult for the uh, either the municipal commissioner or the mayor in council to uh, resist pressures when sometimes, you know, they give issues on religious grounds, on social grounds, and various issues they raise. And it's difficult for them to uh, say no. So that is one thing which I think one can keep at the back of the mind. Then 
I uh, I also mentioned that uh, that you know I tried to compare the regulations in uh, uh, Calcutta with the regulations in uh, Mumbai and Maharashtra. Now uh, I will say the positive features in the regulations in Calcutta are they provide for the transfer of development rights to be made available to the builder. This is very important because in many heritage buildings, you find that the available, particularly those in the commercial areas or in South Mumbai, the available force place index has not been used. So if a person can demolish the building, construct a much larger building, a taller building, more FSI, it can make a um, uh, lot of money. So there is always pressure for demolition of these buildings. So in fact, the Heritage Conservation Group of Maharashtra has been suggesting to the state government also, you must have a provision whereby whatever development rights the individual will lose by conserving that building, he should be allowed to use it elsewhere or he should be able to sell it to some other builder elsewhere. So that if not in that heritage area, some other area, the uh, rights can be exercised and he can get the, he doesn't lose financially. This is, I think, a very good feature of the, the Calcutta regulations. Second, I think the, uh, I find another feature is that uh, if an owner of a heritage building is maintaining the building, in a, um, uh, preserving the heritage value, there is a provision for grant of exemption from taxes. So that is a positive incentive for them. And um, uh, I think this also we had been suggesting to the state government that you must have a provision whereby um, uh, the uh, owner gets some financial incentive. Otherwise, today what happens is if there's an old building, the owner doesn't want to preserve it, he does not have to do anything. He just allows it to um, um, uh, gradually deteriorate and um, collapse on fine day. And um, uh, he has two advantages. First advantage is he can have a much larger floor place construction. Second thing is many of these old buildings are tenanted buildings where tenants are paying nominal rents and they cannot be evicted. So he gets rid of the tenants also. So that is why I find even in many of the buildings which are owned by even government, uh, government undertakings, they allow the buildings to voluntarily to deteriorate so that they can exploit the space and they can get rid of the tenants. So this is, I think, a good idea that at least you give the tax exemption is available. Then, of course, I'll say the, uh, the question of overruling the Heritage Committee does not arise because here in the Calcutta, the committee itself is constituted by the mayor and headed by the mayor and council and most of the members are nominated by them. Then uh, now coming to the positive side of the uh, Maharashtra regulations, as I said, the first point is the uh, notification of the regulations, constitution of the committee rest with the state government where certain independence can be exercised. And second thing is, unlike the Calcutta regulations, there is no explicit provision for demolition of the buildings. I don't know why the Calcutta regulations, they say permission can get demolition. I think once a building is notified as a regulation, uh, demolition is should be, I would say, the, uh, uh, should not be normally permitted unless there are very, very exceptional circumstances. And uh, uh, thirdly, in um, uh, Calcutta, they also have a provision saying that if a building is notified as a draft heritage regulations, then for uh, permissions required for the municipal corporation, for um, uh, leasing or for um, uh, selling the building. I don't know whether this restriction is really necessary because if the character of the building is not being changed, I think there should be no uh, objection to a person leasing it or selling it or anything. I think probably he may like to sell it to a person who may be more interested in preserving the heritage. So I think that restriction seems to be somewhat unnecessary. Then the Third point I wanted to make was that, you know, one way in which you can uh, get the involvement of the, um, uh, both the public citizens, political authorities, administrators is 
can you identify buildings or areas which are having a character which you think is worth preserving and send a proposal for notification as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So once you do it, then three things happen. It develops a sense of pride in the people that uh, our building has come in the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Secondly, it also puts an obligation on the various authorities to see that the heritage character is preserved. And thirdly, it also attracts tourists to that area, so adds to the business and revenue in that area. So uh, I think the Mumbai, for instance, many years ago, the um, uh, what used to be Victoria Terminus, now the CST was notified as a World Heritage Site. Recently, the Marine Drive precinct has been notified. Marine Drive Oval also is that. I quote like that. I think if that kind of a movement is initiated, then probably uh, there could be some kind of a, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, incentive or inducement for people to uh, preserve and maintain these buildings and showcase them as their, uh, uh, what they call as a, uh, the pride of the city. Great. Now, last point I will mention, which mm -hmm. is not, see, uh, many times, Heritage buildings are damaged not because people want to do damage, they are damaged unwittingly. So I think it is necessary for uh, the engineers in the municipal corporation, engineers in state government and government of India who are maintaining heritage buildings. Some of them have to be trained in heritage conservation, how these buildings are to be maintained and all. And even outside architects, we find there's a shortage of architects who are really trained in um, uh, conservation and maintenance of heritage building. I think this training process is important. And we find that apart from that, craftsmen also require to be trained. We need these old buildings where there is some woodwork, some typical uh, paintings are there, various architectural features. You require craftsmen which you have to, there is a shortage of craftsmen for uh, maintaining or for repairing these buildings. I think this is also an area where we should place some emphasis. And apart from, as I have been said, creation of public awareness, organization of programs, then the citizens become a force for heritage conservation. As has happened in the case of environment, it is because of public awareness that uh, the authorities have to take some care of the environment. That is also necessary, I think. Thank you. Fantastic. I mean, you you raised some really uh, uh, important points to do with the uh, independence of uh, of the Heritage Conservation Committee. Uh, how it won't be a properly functioning committee if it is subjected constantly to government pressure. That comes from it being uh, from it being part of uh, uh, the the municipal corporation. Other points you've raised about incentivizing uh, neighborhoods, the the uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, uh, idea as as a, as a way of incentivizing the, uh, you know the city and the neighborhoods uh, and uh, the, the the need for craftsmen you've you you you've uh, raised some very important points here I hope that we can remember them in order to develop on them and and uh, you know to to uh, to get out of this kind of paradox in which. Uh, various paradoxes in which India, uh, sorry, in which Calcutta is, is stuck right now vis-a-vis -vis heritage. Uh, I don't think we have time for questions because, uh, uh, you know, uh, we've overrun like crazy. I mean, the, 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 the participants had such interesting things to say. I would love to take questions, but it is, yeah, it's quite late. And I think Esther would need to go to another meeting as well. So, um, I'll ask, uh, I personally want to thank you, Gen I genuinely want to thank each one of you for bringing related things to the table, but also very distinctively unique things. I mean, things that are, that come from your own experience rather than just uh, narrow expertise. So, so uh, it's been very, very interesting to listen to you all. In, in different ways. I, I want to ask GM Kapoor of Intac to, to offer a vote of thanks. And I want to again thank Bengal Club for the Zoom platform and you know uh, for, for publicizing this event, the support they've given us. Uh, and 
I'd like GM Kapoor from Intec to say a few words at the end of this, uh, what I thought was a really interesting uh, session. Thank you, thank you very much, Amit. Uh, of course, it goes without saying that uh, we've had a very interesting evening. And uh, in spite of the fact that all the experts who are here may not be experts in heritage conservation, but they are certainly a multifaceted group of experts who can provide a lot of inputs into the area of heritage because heritage is everyone's baby. It's not uh, only the heritage conservationists baby. Everybody should be involved in heritage and everybody should be involved in heritage conservation. That has been our approach all this while. And of course, uh, Mr. Ranganathan, thank you very much for all the expert comments on the uh, BMC, um, uh, Mumbai Corporation's uh, uh, rules. But I would just like to mention that while we have the uh, in our conservation, uh, in our uh, uh, rules uh, of the KMC, uh, the fact that there is a TDR provision and there is an incentive provision, but unfortunately, our rules have not yet been formulated and uh, you know passed. So these TDR and incentives are not available to the heritage building owners. And uh, of course, Amit, I would like to mention that this was the whole uh, idea of heritage economy brought about by a government officer who was a then municipal commissioner, Mr. Ashim Barman. And uh, in fact, we got a lot of assistance from the BMC's, uh, you, I think Mr. Ranganathan would remember Shyam Chanani, uh, who was very actively involved in the K Calcutta legislation also. But anyway, thank you very much, all of you. And we got so much, uh, I think, uh, so many interesting inputs from our friends from overseas and Mr. Sunil Khilani also. Uh, we do hope that such conversations will continue in future. It's very important that these conversations, which uh, I mean, this particular conversation, which was started by uh, with the initiative of Amit, uh, will continue. And it is only these conversations we can get people all involved in getting the heritage movement off the ground. Thank you once again to all our participants, to Bengal Club, as well as the, uh, the, the panel of speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank you. much again. Thank you. And goodbye. Bye. Until next time.